morning, all. My name is Jerry Ward. I'm the director of fisheries with Kikitalik Corporation, located in Nunavut. I'd like to thank the Fisheries Council of Canada for the opportunity to co-sponsor this event with Baffin Fisheries Coalition. Uh, the marine biodiversity and sustainable fisheries management is extremely important to Nunavut. These are issues that are paramount to the development of our new fishery. Sustainability is the key to our success. I am pleased to see such a distinguished panel here to address the issues of sustainability and sustainable fisheries. QC is an Inuit birthright company started in 1983. We are 100% owned by the Kikitani Inuit Association, which represents all 13 communities in the Kikitani region. Our, object, our objective is to maximize the benefits to Nunavut. We are a very diversified company involved in construction, real estate, hotel, logistics, and a major sector of our business is the fishing industry. We own and operate factory freezer vessel. We have quarters in both shrimp and turbot in the offshore. These quarters are administered by DFO as well as NWNB. Our focus is on maximizing benefits to Nunavut. And I want to say, last year we employed some 500 people in our organiz various organizations, and more than 75% were Inuit. Thank you. I look forward to a good discussion today. Hello. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Flanagan, CEO of Baffin Fisheries. Baffin Fisheries is a commercial fishing enterprise like many others. We operate commercially. We pay our taxes. We have a fleet of three factory freezer trawler vessels, and we fish the pristine Arctic waters adjacent to Nunavut. We're 100% Inuit owned by land claim beneficiaries in five Inuit communities. We take great efforts to protect the pristine environment we work in. We follow all sustainability requirements. But what you may not know about Nunavut fishing enterprises is that we are subject to a second layer of oversight. The Nunavut Wildlife Management Board scores fishing companies on their sustainability initiatives and efforts. And these points help determine how much quota we have and how much we maintain. It's an important system of checks and balances that reward sustainability initiatives that go well beyond the regulations. So we are really looking forward to hearing about the new developments in biodiversity research, and we're always looking for new opportunities to further protect the marine environment that we work in every day. And we're very happy to be part of this series put together by the FCC and the futureeconomy.ca. Thank you. Welcome to the viewers of this informative interview uh, and panel session we're going to have on behalf of the Fishery Council of Canada. This is a biodiversity and sustainable fisheries management panel. We're excited uh, to work with the Future Economy on this, uh, on this, and the Fisheries Council of Canada on this panel. And I have some in very interesting, uh, very experienced panelists here with me today. Uh, I have, uh, and, and please uh, say hello. I have Philippe Morel, the Assistant Deputy Minister of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. He's a uh, ADM for Aquatic Ecosystems. I have Susanna Fuller, who is with the uh, Oceans North, a, a prominent Canadian conservation organization, and she's the Vice President of Operations and Projects at Oceans North. I also have Chris Viscato. He's the Executive Director at the Atlantic Grindfish Council, one of the major fishing industry associations uh, in Atlantic Canada and in Canada. So welcome to you all. Would you like to say hello? I'm very pleased to be here. It's Philippe here, and very pleased to be here for this panel with the colleagues that uh, we know well and working in close relationships, so uh, nice to be here today. Thank you, Jay. Hi, Jay. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and um, all the all the issues I think we'll discuss are really important to Canada as we move forward on a on a progressive ocean agenda. Thank you, Jay. It's a, a flattering introduction and uh, very glad to be here and to get an opportunity to discuss these issues that are really quite relevant to all of our industries and all of our perspectives to bring them together to provide some sort of cohesive path forward. Thank you. Super. It looks like we're going to have a great panel. And I was remiss in actually not introducing myself uh, to the viewers. Um, my name is Jay Lugar. I'm the head of fisheries uh, in outreach, the outreach department of the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, MSC is a global organization focused on uh, improving ocean health, health for this and future generations. We uh, operate a fishery standard that fisheries volunteer to come into the program to, uh, to do document and demonstrate uh, through a third party audit system, their sustainability attributes. We also offer an echo label so consumers can find sustainable products 
in their stores. And I know that everybody uh, on this panel has had some engagement in the embassy program uh, through their organizations. So I thank you very much for that engagement. And, um, and without any further uh, patting myself on the back, I think we'll just move directly into the topic of the day, biodiversity, sustainable fisheries management. These are key topics that we all encounter on a daily basis. We, do, we talk about them through policy, but we also know that, th that there's activity and, and actions and, and efforts going on in our oceans, and things may not be as, as they once were. But, but let's start first with maybe some, some concepts about what sustainable fisheries are all about. And, and as the manager of fisheries in Canada, Philippe, can you give us briefly how, how DFO would describe uh, the main features of a sustainable fishery in Canada? Yes, I, I'm pleased to. Well, uh, fisheries management is, is very complex, as we all know on this panel. And uh, of course, DFO is is dedicated to uh, sustainable fisheries and I think we progressed a lot in, in the recent years on how we assess stocks and how we react and, and our precautionary approach, uh, more protection under the Fisheries Act uh, to really protect the fish and be able to have a better risk management of the fish stock that do vary due to uh, fishing practice or climate change or things like that. Uh, right now, you know, uh, 70% of, of the fisheries that land, land off are, are uh, accredited under the marine uh, MSC certification, which is quite good uh, and um, doesn't mean that it's perfect, and, but we need to continue to, to do that. We, we have also uh, applied the precautionary approach in, in most of, uh, of our uh, fish stocks, priority fish stocks, and the annual survey that we do, uh, do present more and more encouraging uh, uh, ways of uh, managing uh, in more, not real time, but year to year, uh, the, the stocks that, uh, that will certainly enable us in the future to, to have more sustainable fisheries. Thank you. Now, this from the manager's perspective, uh, and I thank you very much for that, uh, and for the reference to the MSC certified landings but but i would suspect uh that there might be other measures that you would uh, apply to uh so i'm going to turn the, turn this question over to susanna you know wh what do you think may be the features of a sustainable fisheries industry um so you know i've i've thought a lot about this i think i've built my career probably thinking about this issue and trying to act on it um i will agree with philippe that canada's come a long way in the last few years on upgrading its policy and law framework um that will enable sustainable fisheries I'd say at the same time, um, you know, the fishing industry is entirely dependent on whether or not we have fish in the water. And I think one of the issues is that in Canada, we know, you know we've got iconic stock collapses like the cod, cod as an example. Um, we have fish, you know, about 25% of the stocks that DFO assesses are actually also assessed um, by a scientific body that determines whether or not uh, something should be listed under the Species at Risk Act. And I think we, um, we have from an economic perspective which which is really quite important is our fisheries have never really been worth more at the same time we're really relying on lobster and shrimp and crab and crustacean species which are lower down on the food chain and so um getting to a sustainable fishery and, and management that actually makes sure that, that we have healthy populations across the food chain is really tricky because often we make decisions based on economics um because the species we're fishing right now are more valuable than some of those that have been in, that are continue to be in decline. So um, yeah, I think we need we're not quite at a balanced point where we have the healthy ecosystem and it's very hard to rebuild fisheries unless we start right away as soon as we see decline. That takes hard econ socioeconomic decisions that do impact people and communities. And I think that is the um, that's the you know the challenge that the department is faced with. Um, I will say that it's not always more money that's needed to rebuild fish stocks. It's actually hard decisions. And um, yeah, and I, I think the, the piece, the other piece of sustainability is community sustainability, but ultimately we do need to do far more to kind of um, rebuild our stewardship of the industry and stewardship of the environment. And I think we have now more of the pieces in place through our legislation 
the time is coming where we really have to implement those pieces. Um, and just as an example, we've had a bycatch policy since about 2013, 2014, and many of the fisheries still don't have a really strong implementation of that bycatch policy. So that's one piece. And I fully recognize the role that MSC has played in the certification process. I will say that does, that should not preclude Canada from implementing its own laws and policies and sustainable frameworks. Um, and that we can't rely on a, on a third party label. We actually, um, the government of Canada does manage the fisheries for the public good and will be increasingly responsible to reporting out on biodiversity outcomes. Absolutely. I, I would support that as well, uh, uh, Susanna, because um, it takes solid management by uh, engagement by industry and by government uh, in order to achieve the high standard of the MSC uh, certification program. Uh, it's, we're just uh, reviewing all the good work that the people on this panel and the people of Canada, the Fisheries uh, Department, the Fisheries Industry of Canada are actually doing. Chris, can you maybe describe some of the strengths that you see uh, in the sustainable fisheries management program of today? And if you want to highlight any weaknesses, by all, by all means, do so. But, you know, your perspective? By all means, thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, uh, at, at the front end, we have to accept that, you know, from a resource perspective, we've generally done quite well and the, we've done quite well because of the precautionary approach that has been implemented, a very strong regulatory structure that exists in Canada, which really, to be honest, is the admiration of much of the world. Uh, we have a very strong enforcement program. We have uh, incredible investment in science resources that has been able to try and adapt and produce science that uh, somewhat considers the role of the environment change that we're going through. Where this becomes especially relevant is when we talk about things like rebuilding plans, when we talk about uh, things like reference points, it allows us to use the most current uh, science to assess where it is that we're actually trying to go. The ability for us to adapt to these types of changes in, in our policy framework and our regulatory framework is one of the strengths that Canada actually has. Uh, as well, we also have an incredible ability to cooperate among stakeholders. Uh, whether we're working with Susanna's group, Oceans North, or we're working with the department, industry is also sitting there at the table trying to collect information that will improve the science, uh, that will ensure the sustainability of both not just the directed species that we're after, but also those bycatch species that we might attract with and the habitat that's, that actually supports all of these pieces. That type of cooperation is incredibly important, which allows you to get some degree of industry leadership. We're not just trying to do the same thing year after year. We're trying to improve our actions on the water to allow the fisheries to progress in, in, a, in a sustainable and positive fashion. But at the same time, we, as you mentioned, we do have a few weaknesses that we have to acknowledge. Uh, generally, uh, amongst a lot of our, our the Canadian public in general, our successes are generally not shared. Uh, we seem to have a, a, a problem expressing to the Canadians uh, at what a good job we're doing, how many stocks we've actually running at a, at a fishing mortality level that is so low that really it's the environment that is driving the shifts in these stocks. Uh, the role of the fishery in something as simple as greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, we have to understand that the wild caught protein sector is actually a very low greenhouse gas uh, source of protein. We've got a growing world and and this is something that we're going to be able to feed. This has to be communicated to the, to the larger community. Uh, we sometimes find that the regulatory structure might be a little bit too rigid to adapt to a changing environment. We all understand that we're kind of in a, in a state of transition due to climate change, and we have to have a regulatory structure that allows us to understand that the uh, productivity of that species have exhibited from the 1980s when we're in a cooler climate and a different ecosystem function will no longer be attainable. So we have to reflect those productivity values that are today when we're trying to manage whether it's a directed fishery or bycatch. We have to understand that we're looking at uh, fisheries that can often be driven by very, very strong year classes and those year, year classes will kind of disappear as they move through. So yes, we've seen a transition to other things like shellfish and whatnot, whatnot but this is all part of what we have to do. Um, and the last piece I'll touch on is, is really a, a weakness we find in Canada is the stability of access and allocations. In order for stewardship to exist, in order for investment to be made, renewal to happen, we need to, to know as an industry that we're going to be able to continue to access the resources on a year-over-year -year basis. That will get us to, to kind of where we, get, we, we can go to. So 
that's just kind of an overview. I could go for a while on this, but we'll pass it over. I get that. Thank you. That's more than an overview. I think that's very, very in depth and quite broad, broad reaching. Uh, and uh, and I think one of the things we're talking about here is what is an indicator of a sustainable fisheries management system. Obviously, all of you described a, a strong framework, uh, but but in measuring progress against some of these targets, uh, some of the using the framework. I mean, I've seen on on DFO's website that in actual fact some high measure, about 96% of fisheries are, are described as being at sustainable levels of mortality. But Susanna, you described earlier that we don't have biomass levels where they once were. What's a, what's a good measure for sustainable fisheries management, Susanna? Well, you know, I think this is actually one of our problems in Canada, that we don't have clear objectives and indicators of what we mean by sustainability, which is probably why we're, we're talking about this now. Um, you know, I, I would say that um, one of the challenges to the indicators we do have, which are within our precautionary approach framework and, and reference points, is that it is not that difficult to actually change a reference point so that something looks a little bit better than it used to, right? So that, that to me is a problem. Um, I think we are also not measuring ecosystem health and we have a long ways to go to kind of institute that ecosystem approach, which is going to be challenging. Um, as Philippe and Chris have said, we focused on the precautionary approach because we can narrow that down to reference points. I would say what we haven't done is um, included that in our decision making very well and precautionary decision making and ecosystem based decision making across the board. Um, in terms of indicators, I think, again, what we need to do, given that fisheries are still a wild resource and can contribute to our marine biodiversity, we do need to, you know, really have kind of a baseline of where we where we um, where we are now, which I think if we, we could put that together and then understand where we're going in terms of both biomass and species and how we get there. So I, that's the piece I think we're missing is that actual vision and indicators around marine biodiversity. I think on sustainable fisheries, we have those. But um, again, I, I do worry sometimes about our ability when a, you know, when a limit reference point is, if we just moved a little bit, all of a sudden that stock would be in the cautious level, right, as opposed to critical. And, and you know, I call it the limit, limit reference point limbo. <laughs> and we have to be very careful of that um, because I think in some cases, we may not be able to bring stocks back to their former abundance. We know that, right? Whether it's through climate change or, or natural mortality, but we need to be able to talk about that. And I don't think we're talking about that very much. I think we just kind of, you know, sometimes feel abject failure, at least I do, on the fact that cod is still severely depleted. Um, but let's have the harder conversations about what we really mean and how do we have a healthy ecosystem that supports um, coastal communities. And I, that, yeah, anyway, that's the conversation I think we need to have because ultimately fisheries management manages people. It doesn't manage the ocean. It doesn't manage the fish. Um, so a bit of a, yeah. bit of a long-winded answer, but I, I, I think part of our problem is we don't actually have that framework. I understand there's a lot, there's a big topic, a lot to say, and there's a lot of interconnectedness. I mean, you, you, yourself there, Susanna, you talked about, about single species management moving into ecosystem management, and actually that's probably an area of expertise or maybe a, a focus that you have, Philippe. Um, you know, is, is, that, is that where, where Canadian, Canadian fisheries management is going into broader ecosystem-based management? Is that how we can move our, uh, the dialogue over to biodiversity through ecosystem? Uh, focus points, uh, Philippe? So I agree with what uh, Susanna said, uh, Jay, and um, I think we are more and more incorporating the, uh, the ecosystem approach in our decision making. Uh, just as an example, more than half of uh, the fish stock assessments are incorporating environmental uh, variables, and I think this is quite uh, important. It's a, quite an achievement. It's probably not where we want to be uh, in five, ten years or, or, or more than that, but it's certainly the right way. And it's supported by the new Fisheries Act. Uh, and, um, and now we have not only the, the will, but also the authority and the power to do so. Um, I, I know having a sustainable fishery is also taking into consideration everything. And this is also the economic and the social uh, aspect of uh, of the ocean, uh, DFO uh, is is implementing marine spatial planning. Uh, where we have, some of you may have seen, and in, in minister priority is also to implement a blue economy strategy, which will take into consideration the fishing activities, other activities, but also the sustainability of the ocean. And I think that's a very important pillar for the blue economy strategy.
Interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippe. The, uh, so, so, Chris, I, I, would, I would have to think that, that these are fairly high targets to achieve with regard to moving from single species management over to a little bit more diversity. Do, do you think that Canada has established targets around biodiversity that we can measure, can measure them and can we get there? That's an excellent question. Uh, one where we have often looked at the landscape and, and struggled to understand what is the target of biodiversity that we're trying to hit. Uh, we often hear the term uh, thrown around rather loosely, we're protecting biodiversity, but biodiversity is such a broad definition. Uh, it includes plankton, it includes fish, it includes kelp, it includes corals, it includes sponges, it includes worms, it includes everything from basically the top of the bottom, including the birds, all the way down to the bottom. And uh, really, we have to find ourselves uh, some way to be able to quantify it, to understand what we're trying to get to. If we could agree on what the target was, then we could start talking about a path to get it. Because in order to achieve these types of targets, we approach things in different ways. Uh, some might require a strong spatial protection system. Others might require require a very strong regulatory regulatory system and construct to get there. At the end of the day, we come down to achieving the general uh, aims and goals of biodiversity has to be balanced toward uh, sustainable food production. Uh, and science has told us, the academic literature has demonstrated that we can get there uh, by balancing both of these pieces. We have to make sure that we, we are allowing some harvesting activity to take place, and at the same time that we're, we're protecting those important pieces of biodiversity that are out there. But once again, we're stuck trying to understand what it is that we're trying to, uh, trying to protect. For instance, if we talk about some spatial management measures, we tend to look towards the bottom. We talk about corals and we talk about sponges. That's a small component of the ecosystem. Fisheries tend to operate on fairly high energy environments that are they're void of, of much of these benthic features that we're talking about. Uh, and this also comes down to a realization that the entire ocean is not necessarily uh, an inshore kelp bed. There's vast areas out there that if you put a camera down, you don't see all that much. They're not, would not be considered incredibly diverse environments, but there's inherent value in the biodiversity that's there that requires some degree of protection and some degree of conservation. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, understanding the targets and understanding uh, the path would help all of us out and allow getting that clarity through these types of conversations would be to the benefit of all the people at the table. Thank you, Chris. I, uh, once again, a very thorough answer. I, uh, I, I wonder, though, uh, as I turn to thinking about the application of, of identifying targets, but also delivering on, on how we achieve those targets. Susanna, it, it, are, are we looking really at spatial management? Are we looking at identifying areas or, 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 or is it beyond that? Is it, is it, you talked earlier about how we have to manage the people by carving off parts of the ocean. Is that managing people? I mean, are you, your, your thoughts on, on maybe how we get there. Yeah. You know, I used to just want to work on sustainable fisheries and over the past several years, um, I just realized that we have limitations to actually being able to manage human activity. And as you know, we didn't used to be able to fish everywhere. And I think we need to get back to that. Um, I think spatial protections, you know, we, we, we revere them on land, right? We know that they're important on land and they're equally as important in the ocean. They um, provide a place for the ocean to just, you know, be free from a lot of human impacts and industrial activity and recover and be resilient to climate change and act as control areas that we can, you know, actually study the impacts of human activities and, and, and the reduction of threats. So I, I do support the spatial protections. At the same time, I think those have to be supported by communities and the industry. If it is not done together, they will not be effective. And so that's really key. I think the other part, you know, Canada has put itself forward as, as a you know champion of 30% of the ocean. I think it has to be well done. It has to be in places that mean something to people. And, it, and we have to be, um, you know, we can't shut some areas to fishing and then open up to oil and gas and some areas to oil and gas and then open up to trawling. Like we actually have to be consistent because that's the only way we'll get trust in, of Canadians and also internationally that we're doing a good job. So spatial is certainly one, but it is not the only one. There's another 70% of the ocean out there that um, fishing is not the only impact, right? And so um, I think that's where we have to make sure we are implementing sustainable fisheries management measures that include you know, time and area closures, that include bycatch measures, that include all 
the all the basics of fisheries management that I think we're really attempting to do. Um, but it's a piece of the puzzle. I think a target like a number of spatial protection is an easy political thing, right? Um, and it's easy to get governments to sign on, well, relatively easy to get governments to sign on to that sort of thing. It's also easier to achieve it than bringing back, um, you know, bringing our fisheries back up to sustain, maximum sustainable yield. We committed to that in, as far back as 2002 and we're still not there. So I, I do think, um, I think managers are looking for things that they can achieve because fisheries management is hard and there's lots of disappointments along the way. Um, and spatial protection is one that we can actually get to in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and it's multi-stakeholder and has to be. I see. We're, we're, finding, we're finding those things that we can measure. But Philippe, uh, the task, as you even mentioned in your opening remarks, the ta- is highly complex. The task is not easy. Uh, and, and if I listen to Chris and if I listen to Susanna speak about the ways that, that, that the government perhaps needs to step up and, and do some identifi- identifying of identification, if you will, of these targets and, and help, help to get there. Is this something that DFO is up to? Are you ready for this task? In our conversation, how we've seen that it's, it's managing the people, it's managing areas outside, outside the, the areas that are currently being protected, even when we get to 30%. I know a, a DFO is a, is a national organization and you have uh, operations in all three of our coasts. But but to get to the levels of achievement that you've committed to in your in biodiversity uh, and also in spatial planning, I, I see I see uh, significant challenges. Maybe you can just address how you're going to come there. Thank you, Jay. Yes, it is it is significantly challenging, uh, and as I mentioned, just you know protecting an area is one thing. You need to make sure that you have clear uh, conservation objective and that they will contribute to the health of of a bio region. We. We separate uh, the ocean by 13 bioregions, and and there's the, the the marine protected area we can create, or marine refuges, or other type of protections to support biodiversity, to support stocks, or or uh, or, or protect some part of the oceans for certain reasons. But there's all other activities that are happening uh, outside of these protected area that are also very important to take into consideration, and and some are are not in conflict with with uh, the sustainability of the oceans and others may be uh, uh, better if they are in a certain framework where the impact of uh, the activities are reduced to a minimum but also take into consideration the the economic viability of coastal communities or the the the, the, the balance uh, use of the oceans and uh, and you know the, the the fishing sector is certainly one that is a prior uh, interest of the department and every minister I've seen in, in fisheries and ocean is to not only allow uh, the right to fish but also allow the right to fish that to, for a, with a sustainable manner uh, that you know uh, your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters will also be able to fish in the future. Uh, and and on top of that, you have you have the, the other challenge of other use. You have the challenge the challenges of uh, that brings climate change, where stocks migrate to another place and create new environment. So, it, uh, as you said in the introduction question, it is very complex, and we're adapting. The only I think the only way to really succeed is to work with stakeholders and make sure that everyone understand. And when we, why we surpass the 10% uh, target and how we think we will meet the 30% target of uh, ocean protection is exactly by that, is by working with provinces and, and stakeholders and the communities to make sure that what we protect is meaningful, but also it's respected and it's credible. It's not about drawing boxes in the oceans, but it's about drawing the right boxes in the oceans. And we work with... with uh, some of you on the screen today uh, on achieving that and I think it was a great success and and the, the challenge for 2030 is another challenge but I think I'm pretty sure it's something we can we, we can reach and we certainly don't, don't want uh, like to acknowledge the role of um, our Aboriginal organizations as a stakeholder in this dialogue as well uh, today you know you mentioned climate change as being a new driver in this area so I'd like to turn a little bit more to thinking about not only today, although Chris, I suspect you did mention as well that stocks um, adapt the, the, the adaptive management that we need because stocks are con- continuously changing. Uh, the, the, the 
ocean is very dynamic. One of those drivers is climate change. It's a new driver. It's a driver that many, many of us are trying to look at and see exactly how it impacts what plans we have in place today for management, but also what's coming. How can we future proof this? So, so is it is it uh, so? Susanna, I'm going to turn back to you. I mean, uh, uh, is it a simple? Is it simple enough about understanding how stocks are moving, as, as uh, to, to realize what the climate change may be, uh, maybe how it may be impacting our biodiversity, or is it is it itself another very difficult, complex task? Well, it, it is a difficult, complex task, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do something about it. So I think from a fisheries perspective, um, there's a couple ways that climate change can impact, um, and it has been impacting as well. One is just like the basic level of productivity in the ocean. Um, and that's something that we do measure fairly well and we have long-term data sets on. So it's the equivalent of like, think about phytoplankton in the ocean as the trees, they produce primary productivity, and then that you know go feeds the rest of the species up in the food chain. I think making sure that we are not taking out more fish than our primary productivity can actually support over a time period is really important. Um, and getting to that point and thinking about that um, is where we need to go. Uh, we also will see some species being more affected by temperature change than others. So some will be resilient and some will be less so. I think understanding the vulnerability of those species is critical. Um, we also have the issue of ocean acidification, which really is, you know, it's when, when it, the ocean just gets so acidic that you can't species that do rely on calcium such as many of our shellfish species not to mention phytoplankton and diatoms actually aren't able to form those shells and right now canada has that in sort of in, in hot spots in some areas um, it's not happening everywhere but that is going to be uh, an issue and then the other one i think is just um less resilient species like you know we low lobster are kind of moving further north and they do get different kinds of diseases in the warmer waters and so we have to take that into consideration it's going to be hard it's going to be complex um which is why i think the management response is really to like how do we make sure that we are buffering the resilience of our of our fish stocks and our ocean to to be able to manage that and at the same time predicting as much as possible what fisheries can continue and where they can continue in a sustainable manner so it's going to be hard, but fisheries management is not easy in the, at the outset. Um, I think the one good, the, the one thing is that fisheries and, and fishing industry is quite adaptable. And Chris mentioned that early on. I think inshore fleets are very adaptable too. Um, so it, it's an industry that can change. I think having a clear vision on what that means and how we do actually um, respond to climate change is going to be very important. And I know Chris mentioned quickly um, just, you know, the, the low greenhouse gas emissions, um, that are you know that are equated to marine protein i also think i haven't heard a lot about the fishing industry being included in some of our greenhouse gas reduction incentives and i think we actually have a, a lot to do there i think we could do much more to incentivize um lower co2 emission vessels and engines and fuel sources and that actually might be a really interesting way of of getting more industry uptake on a sustainability measure that's not always about the catch Interesting, uh, Susanna. Sounds like we have a new, um, broader CO2 component to our biodiversity targets, and that would help support our biodiversity targets based on that thinking. Uh, Chris, I mean, that's a bit of a challenge to an industry that, that has a lot of um, a lot of difficulty maybe of responding to climate change and moving stocks and, and, and adapting. Obviously, in the last few months, we've had the whole world, including the Canadian fishing industry, has had significant impacts from having to adapt to the new COVID reality, whether it be through in-plant, uh, you know, changes on plant or even in, so, in some of the activities on vessels. So that's not the intention to get into that today. But strictly, uh, you know, there are climate change impacts and I see stocks moving. Are there allocation issues that because you spoke earlier about the need for some consistency and allocation, <clears throat> excuse me, coming from the government of Canada. And so do you see the climate change impacting that in a way, or is it strictly only in terms of adapting the, the, uh, the industry to move where the fish go? Thank you. I mean, that, that's the, the, the climate change is a new reality. It's uh, literally a one way uh, trip, so to speak, that we're on in the near future. All of the models are telling us what we're trying to do is very much like what we're trying to do with COVID. We're trying to flatten the curve. Uh, there are profound impacts because of this. We know that species are changing in distribution. We know that productivity of individual species are changing. Does that create challenges on access and allocation? 
Of course it does. Uh, mainly because if somebody for years was fishing cod in southwest Nova Scotia and that stock is no longer able to be uh, commercially targeted, then we're into a situation where that uh, enterprise now needs to understand what they're able to be going to be able to do. Now we have a couple of tools to do that. There is the rationalization of the fleet, which has been uh, one of the cornerstones of, of the success of some of the sectors that I work with, where they were able to rationalize after the moratoriums of the 1990s. You saw hundreds of vessels disappear in favor of, very, of a handful of vessels that are still fishing. And that was facilitated by good policy and it was facilitated by good regulation, which is also part of a fairly nimble management system that can respond to these changes. So in order to prevent those types of conflicts, what we need is a system that allows for that rationalization to occur. As we see that other resources are coming in, it could be a strong year class of redfish, it could be the black-bellied rosefish that's moving in. These will represent new opportunities that can be accessed. The management system and the regulatory system is nimble enough to allow that to happen. Uh, we, we need for the enterprises to be able to work together towards that outcome to reduce the capacity if need be. But yes, climate change is going to lead to profound uh, uh, conflicts and questions on access and allocation. And that's where we look to the regulator to help us to ensure that five or 10 year investment time frame uh, can still exist while we're looking to reinvest, renew, and bring in a new demographics into the industry. With that certainty, we can do it. Without that certainty, we run into to very strong problems of planning. It even comes down to, as was uh, discussed earlier, about greenhouse gas emissions from vessels. We're seeing new tier three, uh, I believe it's tier three fuel standards being introduced for uh, new builds on vessels. We just had a, a vessel enter the fleet in Newfoundland, uh, the Calvert, which is basically, it's a green vessel designed to recover energy from uh, when it shoots the trawl out and, and brings the trawl back in. These are pieces that are being done to try and reduce the carbon footprint of the fishery. So really, it's true. Industry does innovate. We do try to respond to pressures, but we also need to understand that we'll still be able to have access to the resources to allow the finance and the investment and the renewal to happen to adapt to those pressures. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so sounds like there's lots of activity ongoing in industry, and of course, the demands are there, uh, societal demands and climate change demands. But but Philippe, if I can um, put you on the spot a little bit, uh, industry is expecting a system that can be nimble, that can help them respond to these kind of uh, uh, requirements. And I heard from uh, the conservation community, Susanna, just a few minutes ago, that, 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 that it's not just climate change, it can be CO2 emissions. Is, do you think that the Canadian management system, uh, including in your ability to manage eco ecosystems, uh, which is your portfolio, um, you know, has that level of nimbleness that we can move forward? Thank you, Jay. I think uh, certainly some, some desire to move in that direction. Uh, I, I think we all acknowledge that it's, that it's very complex and sometimes we're, we're on grounds that, we, that are more uncertain than we hope. And, um, and in, in this situation, we need to take risk or assess risk and take risk on how we manage the fisheries. But uh, we certainly don't take risk in a way that, like, the question of taking risk is probably more around making sure that the, we make the right decision and consult and that we have a good level of comfort uh, of, of the impact of certain activities on, on ocean sustainability or, or fisheries industry uh, more than really having a, a risk that is risk adverse and stop everything or too or too uh, permissive uh, and, and risk is not necessarily uh, allow everything quite the contrary risk is knowing risk management is knowing what are the potential impact and see if we can address them the question of uh, of co2 is an important one that was raised by 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 chris earlier uh, this mentioned by Chris and, and Susanna is there's there's things to do and, and we have some programs that are uh, that are advancing on that front uh, probably uh, not where a lot of people would want us to be uh, but there are some technologies to reduce the, the, the CO2s from from ship or from uh, from any production from uh, fisheries industry 
our, our ocean industries and and i think we're moving towards that um and all that needs to be taken into consideration i think you know the ship lanes uh the, the just just look at what happened uh over the last three four years with the north atlantic right whale and the prey moving up and the whales moving up and then a, a total change in how we manage fisheries in the, in the gulf of saint lawrence uh, is a good example of the the potential impact of human activity uh, and and human have to adapt to the human activity and uh, having an ecosystem approach is, is one of the solution and uh, marine spatial planning is another one we need to adapt constantly and probably uh, more frequently than we used to understood and the uh, that example of the right whale you used demonstrates that government can be nimble can respond fairly rapidly in can in canada we have a policy regime not necessarily uh, that, well, that is well founded by a regulatory regime, but our policy initiatives can be can be quite adaptable. Uh, and uh, but one of the things that is noticed, however, is that if I can turn a little bit of our focus to the outside world, maybe some of the listeners of today might be consumers. Do, do you th what, what what do you think is the role maybe of consumers and their buying habits around some of these biodiversity targets, or even around meeting sustainable fisheries targets? Uh, Susanna, you know you're a conservationist, but you're also a consumer. You have a, a growing family in Halifax, and I wonder: Do you think about these things? Is there a role for the consumer in, in affecting the, the the habits, uh, the practices that we in the fishing industry in in, in Canada, uh, you know, follow? Yeah, thanks, Jay. And I, I have a daughter who prefers to eat a dozen oysters every Saturday for breakfast, and mostly likes raw salmon. So I do think a lot about the the role of at least my child in that consumption. Um, you know, I, for a long time I did work um, on consumer facing uh, programs through Sea Choice, and you know the way that I look at consumer, and I know you know MSC that's what MSC does, but. I look at the consumer pull as kind of the long end of the chain and that, you know, the farther away you get from the source, the less that force actually has. And so, you know, I think awareness, consumer awareness is important. I think what's actually been more important and maybe it's increased over COVID is people caring about the environment. Um, I personally think that there there is a role, but it is not the critical role. And a few years ago, um, myself and some colleagues did an assessment of the Marine Stewardship Council and where change actually took place as a result of that certification. And the biggest changes happened between um, the assessment and the actual certification, but not afterwards, right? And so I kind of switched my focus to really, um, you know, on Canadian fisheries management and implementing our existing sustainable fisheries framework and improving the Fisheries Act, because I think it's the st at the state level, there's the real responsibility. It's not to say that consumers are not important. It's just that an incredible amount of money can go into trying to get people to shift their attention to care about something that in Canada, quite frankly, we don't eat that much seafood. We eat much less seafood than Europe and in the U.S. And we export about 70 percent of our seafood in Canada. So when it comes to Canadian consumers, you know what they care about is plastic in the ocean. <laughs> really, that's what people are focusing on. Um, I so I. Yeah, uh, on the consumer piece, it's important, but it is not at all the be all end all. And I don't think it's the most important thing, particularly not for a nation that we rely so much on exports to markets that actually are so pleased to get fresh fish from uncontaminated waters that they don't have that. That's the most important piece. Right. So, um, yeah, but but at the same time, Canadians do care about biodiversity in our ocean. And we did a survey last year and Atlantic Canadians feel that oceans are vital to our economy, but also they value them for their natural beauty and um, experience on the ocean. So, um, yeah. Understood. And, uh, and I would agree that the consumer would like to be, to know what they're buying uh, with the MSC Ec label or in, in general terms that, that it comes from healthy, sustainable oceans. Uh, and, uh, and, and one of the ways we get there, we've had some of this dialogue here today about participating and working together. Uh, uh, Philippe, uh, you, you mentioned it clearly that there's um, uh, ways that we, if we don't work together, we're going to probably have this more, have a little bit more difficult time with this. Are there actionable steps that the government is taking that can bring people to the table, that, that can help us achieve some of these biodiversity and sustainable fishery management um, t goals? Well, thank, thank you, Jay. And I think there there are some other steps that we can take to uh, enforce the relationship with stakeholders. Uh, so uh, I, I think with, with province and industry, with marine spatial planning that I referred to earlier, 
I think it's a it's a, an important step uh, to uh, make sure that we all are aligned in the same direction and agree on the general objectives of how we manage the ocean. Uh, I, I think also uh, like we we're we're open to have uh, suggestions from every stakeholder on how we can enhance our relationship. Uh, things like you know uh, reporting, uh, transparency on decision, uh, sharing science. I think is all things that uh, we're not against. You're probably less used to, but we're not against uh, doing that. And we need to find ways of what we need to share and how we will need to share and how we can better inform of our decision. And I, I also I, I want to emphasize the importance of, uh, of uh, indigenous people and how they should be part of decision and, and understand and be able to be understood of their position on fisheries. They're, they're big contributors to the fishing industry. They're big contributors of the ocean sustainability and, and the ocean um, the respect. I think uh, just uh, we were referring earlier about you know, marine refuges or marine, marine um, protected areas and they care and they want to be guardian and, and monitor those areas to make sure that, that we respect our engagement towards protecting uh, protecting those those spaces for for the sustainability and sustainability of ocean have, as a I think a more powerful means for them than for us bureaucrats and in and in, in, in federal offices um, and we need to learn a lot from from that relationship which is better and better and will continue I sincerely hope to to be even better. I mean, these people, are, these groups, or people that represent these groups, are are rights holders, and uh, and they need to be part of decision making. They need to collaborate with industry, and they be, need to be part of of, a, of the industry for the for the future and sustainability of our oceans and fishing industry. Uh, thank you, Philippe. Uh, you know, Chris. There are stakeholders and there's uh, a variety of uh, important stakeholders in the fishing industry and in, in managing fisheries uh, through DFO and through the collaboration that we have. But, but there's also livelihoods. There are people whose livelihood depends on this, on, on a healthy, productive uh, ocean. Uh, those may be indigenous uh, uh, harvesters, but they're also commercial harvesters, even including indigenous commercial harvesters. But commercial harvesters that have been at this for for tens, almost hundreds of years, in in some cases, like the lobster industry in Atlanta, Canada. Uh, you know, is it how difficult is it, or maybe is it a positive thing? I mean, what's the fishing industry doing to work collaboratively with these other voices and in and, and making sure that sustainable fisheries management and the biodiversity targets that we've been discussing here today how how they're being met? That's a big question, uh, and I, I would have to say that you know we do have some existing mechanism <laughs> we do have some existing mechanisms in place that help us get to where we have to go. We have advisory committees that are these formal uh, settings where we can sit down as a multi-stakeholder group that includes those in the commercial fishing industry, uh, environmental uh, non-government organizations, include First Nations as well, allows us to sit in a room and have a conversation and, and make recommendations together about what should happen with a fishery. That's how those, those discussions begin. But let's not forget that a lot of discussions actually happen away from those tables as well. So once we build that, that type of relationship structure, then when we go away, I can have a conversation with some other individuals that are on this, uh, on this panel to discuss something like a marine protected area or discuss something like an objective of a limit reference point. Uh, at the same time, uh, we can discuss where th with other stakeholders where their uh, interests or their pressures may be. So a lot of this discussion is already happening. Uh, and thankfully, it's facilitated by the department in some of these larger advisory uh, processes that are quite transparent and quite open. I mean, overall, a lot of this comes down to informing Canadians at large of the job that we're doing. So if it comes to, to protecting biodiversity, we're not necessarily all working against one another. We're working towards something. And not only are we working towards something, I would say that we're, we're part way there. To be able to, as a unified stakeholder group, tell Canadians at large that story would do uh, us great benefit overall, I think, in ensuring that we can move forward on some of these pieces uh, by defining a path together and knowing where we're trying to get to. 
Understood. I think it's a very good message. And I think we're nearing the end of our time together, folks. Uh, what I would like to do is to give each of you a minute, hopefully not that much more, be a little concise about and answer, try to, in your own words, reconcile the question between the, the blue economy that was in the throne speech and the strategy that the Fishery Council of Canada recently released to help us meet that the, these targets. Reconcile that with the need for biodiversity protection. Can you just you know, give us a minute in your wrap-up comments uh, on that? Uh, and Susanna, I'll turn to you first. Sure. Thank you, Jay. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, I think the blue economy has to be advanced in a way that um, supports biodiversity protection and environmental sustainability and also um, really reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. If we do not address that, and I, I can say that from Nova Scotia today, we will not be able to get to a lot of other um, important issues that we need to address together um, for our oceans. And um, I'll just, you know, agree with what Chris said is that relationships are vital. Um, relationships, even when we don't agree, are vital because we can check in with each other when we know each other. And I think in, in the fishing, fishing is the most political, the fishery is the most political file in some ways in this country because it, um, yeah, it just, it, it's hearts and minds and resources and jobs and the environment all together. So I would say that we need to have, when we move forward in the blue economy, um, you know, one thing is like anything that we put forward towards funding, any, any taxpayers' dollars that go towards funding marine initiatives should be grounded in sustainability, right? Should, ha should be tied to our international commitments and our national commitments um, on biodiversity protection. That's vital. Um, otherwise, we end up fighting industries um, on, on, you know, on government priorities, which shouldn't really happen, right? Um, I do think we need a big, a bigger vision. And I do think in that vision, we need some simple things to achieve. I think the 30% has allowed a lot of us to focus on something that, that maybe we came to reluctantly, but we are focusing. I think we need equivalent focuses, like whether or not it's, we're going to rebuild forage fish, or we are going to restore a certain amount of fish habitat, um, or we're going to start to consider how our marine environment contributes to natural solutions to climate change from protecting eelgrass beds and kelp beds to um, you know, making sure that we can just be resilient to climate change. I think we need a few big picture things that are not, that are embedded in that blue economy framework. Otherwise they will be seen as different and we will continue to have our economy and our environment separated in the ocean, which is where, you know, it's actually almost so completely linked. Um, so, and then I, I yeah, I, I, I do Thank think you. people talking to each other is vital to move those things forward. Thank you, Susanna. And uh, Chris, in one minute, uh, uh, your, your wrap uh, in closing comments on the same theme. Thank you, Jay. Uh, really, I, I, I think part of uh, growing our ocean economy as a whole uh, really does rely on biodiversity protection, sustainable fisheries management. And I say that uh, understanding that we also have to incorporate a realistic expectation of what sustainable fisheries management and biodiversity protection actually means in light of a system that is in the middle of a transition between what was and what will be. And as we get better science advice out there to tell us what this new endpoint is going to be, then we can start providing the targets and uh, a path to actually achieve that. That's how the blue economy is actually going to grow in Canada. Then we'll have, be able to produce seafood products that will be destined for top shelf uh, around the world because they'll be acknowledged for just not just being sustainable because of a third party sustainability, but will be uh, acknowledged for low greenhouse gas emissions, uh, will be acknowledged as, as contributing to, to the larger targets that we're trying to achieve, whether it be IUCN, uh, BBNJ, or, or these larger groups that have established worldwide targets for us to get to. Uh, so really, I, I'm going to leave it at that because it's such a big topic. We could spend another two hours having a discussion of it, and I'd probably talk for an hour and a half of it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jeff. I understood, Chris. Thank you. And so we started with Philippe and the and the mandate that government has to to grow the blue economy, but also to protect biodiversity. So I'll, the last word to you, Philippe, uh, in terms of uh, how achievable you think this might be. Well, uh, thank you, Jay, and thanks to the FCC for organizing that discussion. I think uh, we we had some very interesting exchange and and. Actually, the blue economy objective, uh, and that's what the department is trying to achieve, is to make sure that on all three coasts of, of our country, uh, that we have uh, we have a potential for for economic activities and economic growth, but in respect of also uh, the uh, the use by the ocean by indigenous people, but also make sure that 
um, the, the all the pillars uh, of, of a sustainable strategy uh, are in place. So that means that yes, indigenous uh, rights are respected, that uh, the industry respect uh, the ecosystem, uh, that the, we have a, a comprehensive ecosystem approach, uh, and uh, that uh, we offer uh, oceans where marine safety is also very important for everyone that goes by uh, the ocean. So for us, you know, there are several uh, programs that are being put in place or are already in place that will build up to the blue economy and what it will represent in, uh, and it will be announced uh, in the near future. But certainly uh, just having uh, internally several departments that play a, plays a key, that they play a key role uh, on the oceans uh, working with uh, Fisheries and Ocean Canada on defining what is the blue economy is a big achievement. Having the provinces and the industry on marine spatial planning that we're implementing in, in priority bioregion is another big accomplishment. The, the marine conservation target that we surpassed for 2020, but that we will reach for 2025 and 2030 to up to 30% is another big accomplishment. But all that makes sense when each of these pillars and each of these objectives are aligned and speak to each other. And I think uh, the objective of, of uh, the discussion today was certainly a good way of demonstrating that it's, that it's feasible. So thanks a lot. Uh, thank, you for uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, definitely reached the end of our time. I think we've, we're the, this, this panel is demonstrating the collaboration necessary to identify to develop the action plans and to so we as a society as a fishing industry and as a government and as a Canadian society can can lead the world potentially on on, on achieving some of these biodiversity targets Canada was an early signatory and a, a developer of the, of the convention on biodiversity uh, and uh, and that's something we didn't bring out today but I think we can now reestablish our place and demonstrate that these things that these targets can be achieved uh, through economic uh, uh, social and, uh, and making sure that coastal communities and livelihoods are, are in place today uh, with with uh, collaboration that we've seen here on the panel. So I thank you very much for, for your contribution to our dialogue. With us today we had Philippe Morel, the Assistant Deputy Minister for Aquatic Ecosystems uh, at Fisher and Oceans Canada. We had Susanna Fuller, the uh, Vice President Operations and Projects at Oceans North a prominent Canadian conservation uh, organization. And we also had uh, Chris Fiscato, the executive director of the Atlantic Grand Forest Council with us. And I would like to thank the Fisheries Council of Canada and the futureeconomy.ca to, uh, for helping us put on this panel. And I hope you enjoyed it and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.